Great. Well, I would like to welcome everyone back once again to uh, centers and peripheries. And now we will be hearing from Professor. I just lost my piece of paper. Sorry. Uh, from Professor Jack Liu, who's the University Distinguished Professor. Um, Rachel Carson, Chair in Sustainability and Director of the Center for Systems Integration and Sustainability at Michigan State University in the United States. Uh, and he will talk to us about telecoupling, sustainability, and resilience in the post-COVID-19 perspective, or maybe the during COVID-19 perspective. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh... Meredith, and also thanks uh, to all the organizers and uh, participants in this important uh, timely uh, webinars. And it's my pleasure to um, talk with you today and uh, welcome to your uh, comments and suggestions later. Now, let me share my screen with you. And um, Can you see my screen okay? Yes. Okay. Then uh, Mary is asking me to talk about telecoupling, sustainability, resilience in the post COVID 19 perspective. So I will focus on um, insight from past shocks because in the past we have experienced a lot of uh, pandemics too and also other shock, natural disasters and the financial uh, disruptions and so on and so forth. Because we are still in the middle of uh, COVID-19, I think the insight from past shocks could help us to discuss or pre um, project what will happen in the future to sustainability and the resilience in the post-COVID-19 world. Um, I'm with the Center for Systems Integration and Sustainability. By systems integration, we mean integrating everything across different disciplines, across different locations, and so on and so forth. And uh, as you can see here, a slide show distant interactions. Uh, this is just um, examples between urban areas and the rest of the world. These are very familiar to you. And uh, urban area require a lot of uh, resources from other areas like agricultural products, water, energy, and so on and so forth. On the other hand, urban area also provide a lot of industrial products, information, technology, and tours to other places. So there's a lot of those kind of interactions. And um, so here I'm, I'm showing the centers and the per peripherals also uh, couple the human natural systems because uh, the humans and the natural system interact with each other. Humans in this case um, have different sectors, different stakeholders, they interact across different organization levels and they have impact on natural system. The natural systems also have interactions among the natural component like abiotic factors, biotic factors of animals, plants, and so on and so forth. They also work for, uh, interact across different organizations. On the other hand, human impact on natural systems and the natural system change will feedback, will have impact on natural uh, human systems. So they form a couple of the human natural systems. So either a city or rural areas can be viewed as a couple of human natural systems. So there are three major types of distant interactions. And uh, you have heard about teleconnection. Teleconnection comes from the climate science and several decades ago. And to emphasize the environment interactions between natural systems over distance. For example, climate change in one place could have impact on climate thousand miles or away. Right? And on the other hand, you have heard a lot globalization. Globalization mainly focuses on the social economic interactions between human systems over distance. So the concept 
Taylor coupling integrate the previous concept, which is um, social, economic, and the environment interactions between coupled human natural systems over distance. Because every city, every rural area is a couple of human natural systems. So this is more realistically reflect what happening in the real world rather than just the, a natural system or human system. So Taylor coupling is an umbrella concept and also expanded the concept of distant interactions. By umbrella, I mean, you know, includes many types of uh, uh, distant interactions, like just like ecosystem services has different types of ecosystem services. Taylor coupling also have different types of uh, uh, distant interactions. So I'm giving you a, some examples here, like animal migration, and uh, which is very familiar to many of you because it has been extensively studied by ecologists. But those studies mainly focus on ecological side of animal migration. And, but animal migration also had tremendous you know, uh, social economic implications. And actually a lot of migrant animals uh, have stops in cities. And so you may see a lot of birds in the cities and that some of them are uh, migrant birds. So if you include both the ecological and social economic dimensions of animal migration, then animal migration can be treated as a Taylor coupling. On the other hand, human migration has been extensively studied by demographers, but they mainly focus on the demographic aspect. But human migration also has enormous environmental impacts. And so if we include both social, economic, and the environmental impact, then human migration can be treated as a Taylor carbon part. The same with trade. Trade focuses on economic aspect, but trade also has a lot of environment impact. So trade can be treated as a Taylor carbon. There are so many others, like investment, tourism, uh, knowledge transfer, technology transfer, water transfer, waste transfer and species dispersal, all can be viewed as a Taylor coupling if we, we expanded the scope of um, dimensions. So because they are uh, quite complex, so we need an integrated framework to address ecological and social economic interactions over distance simultaneously. So, my collaborators and I develop a framework, what we call Taylor coupling framework, which has several major components. One is what we call a sending system. It's a place that sends something out and uh, like exporting countries send goods out and through the flows, flows could be the movement of energy, people, uh, material and uh, goods and the product, information and so on and so forth. So the receiving system receive those flows can be like an importing country, for example. And then receiving system also have feedback on sending system. And those two type of system are very familiar with many people, but there is another type of system that we call the spillover system, which is uh, uh, usually overlooked, but they are affected by interaction between sending and receiving system. So I will give examples later, and, but I just want to bring your attention now. This is a very important, but uh, understudied type of system. So for details, and some of those people who are interested in more information about the Taylor Carbon Framework can read this paper, which was co-authored by 23 natural scientists and uh, social scientists. And now I'm going to give you an example about Taylor coupling on the sharks at the global level. Right? And this is a diagram show the dynamics of global export per GDP. This is a percentage of GDP which were for export. 
So this is a time frame from 1880 to more recent, right? So we have far divided this uh, time period in the six um, periods. A is the um, very hot, is a very uh, a prosperous period of time for economic development, right? But the time B, which start with uh, the first uh, the world one, uh, world one, and then followed by uh, Spanish flu. And then also the other uh, uh, world war, world war two. So you can see this uh, global export has changed uh, a lot, reduced a lot over time. And then after the war, and then the export became to increase. So that's kind of recovery. It's kind of resi resilient in uh, actions here. And then in uh, uh, time B is the economic recessions in the 1980s. And then um, also uh, then you continue to E. Uh, this is a time that uh, uh, the World Trade Organization was established and the growth of e-commerce. So you see more and more um, export across the world. Then by uh, the beginning of uh, time F, we have a great recession in the late 2000, 2000 okay, early 2010s. So kind of this diagram which illustrates there are a lot of shocks, but they have reduction in export and then recover. And so it's kind of a resilience uh, in display here. So this is a diagram show at a global scale. And now I'm going to show you another example, show the Taylor problem between a remote rural area and cities worldwide. And here is the example uh, that uh, my collaborator and I have been working on this for more than half uh, a quarter century. As the Ordnance Nature Reserve for Panda Conservation is uh, located in the southwest part of China. And here, this different color indicate different elevation level from uh, 1,200 meters to more than 6,000 meters. So very complex demography, uh, the, the, the bar, uh, topography. And, but the pandas love those places. And besides pandas, there are also people. And they, there are about 10% of wild pandas in this nature reserve. It is a lot, one of the largest nature reserve for panda conservation established in 1975. It's a flagship nature reserve because the government and international organization provide a lot of uh, technical and financial support. So as I mentioned earlier, besides pandas and other species in this uh, global biodiversity hotspot, there are also um, more than 5,000 local residents here. So that constitutes a nice couple of human natural system because they interact with each other. And uh, here are some examples of telecarbon between Onun and uh, the cities across the world. And we have agricultural product going out from Onun Nature Reserve because most of the people in Onun are farmers to produce agricultural product. In order to produce agricultural uh, product, they have to buy industrial product like a fertilizer to enhance their production. And then information about Onun uh, is disseminated to the rest of the world through news media and so on and so forth. And then the conservation investment come from outside, from the government or from international organization. And then we have pandas in the reserve going to the zoos in other places in cities around the world. And then tourists from around the world, mainly from cities, come to visit Onum. So I'm going to illustrate some of this um, type of uh, Taylor carbon here. One is tourism. So people come to the reserve to see the pandas and then also um, landscapes here. And the people come from around the world. And this is a, a, a result from a survey that we did uh, for more than 1,000 tourists. And we asked them where they come from. 
here the top size indicate the number of tourists, you know, from Europe, from US, and so on and so forth. And this diagram shows the number of tourists to Onun over time uh, from 1980. And then it increased over time. But in 2003, there was a big drop in the number of tourists. Why? Because there was a big uh, uh, SARS out, uh, outbreak. SARS, for those who are uh, old enough to remember, is uh, also a contagious uh, disease caused by corona, uh, coronavirus too. And uh, so that has a relationship with what we have now, the um, COVID-19. So SARS appeared in 2003, so they all had to close the road and uh, also lock down, and then spread out to other countries within a few months. And um, so totally, there are more than 8,000 people in two, uh, 26 countries here are showing this map uh, were infected and uh, with more than 700 people died. So compared to the COVID-19, the impact or the degree of, uh, of uh, the distribution, uh, the spray was much smaller, right? But still has quite big impact. However, compared to some other shocks like the earthquake, the impact was much more. This earthquake in 2008 basically uh, destroyed the road and then the tourists could not go to the owner. So basically there was no tourists there. So that's uh, uh, another example of shocks besides the pandemic or the outbreak or ep epidemic. So, the, the tourism example is to talk about people come in to Onan, but Onan also sent pandas out. Besides the wild pandas in uh, Onan, Onan also has um, a big breeding center, which is very successful. One year, the breeding center produced 16 baby pandas, all survived. So with so many pandas in the breeding center, so some of the pandas were sent out to zoos around the world by loans. So for pandas going to other countries like France, for example, and it is $1 million a year for usually for 10 years. And um, so uh, the number of pandas living in zoos outside the ocean increased over time, despite the SARS, but the SARS impact was, you know, really uh, minimum. And here is showing the distribution of zoos around the world with pandas from Onan. Right? You have uh, this is data from 2010 and then uh, from US, from uh, uh, Europe and uh, also uh, other countries. And then most of them are inside country, inside China. And the number of uh, uh, pandas showing in red dot and uh, the size of the dot shows the um, number of uh, pandas in the particular zoos. So if you take a traditional perspective, look at the panda loan and the, the transport of pandas from Onun to another place like a, a Edinburgh Zoo, it's kind of simple. You have uh, Onun is a sending system and the Edinburgh is a receiving system the airplane carry pandas to uh, the zoo there, right? But in reality, it's much more complex. And so we take a telecarbon perspective on panda loan, then you can see actually um, the starting point is of the airplane uh, was in Memphis, Tennessee, right? And then made a stop in Anchorage in Alaska to add fuel. And then flew to uh, Chengdu, uh, the nearby airport near Onun. And then get the pandas on board, then drop the pandas to Edinburgh. So that's not in the, in the end of the story yet. And then the airplane had to go back to Memphis. So from here to here is a spillover system. 
So the spillover systems are the areas affected by the interaction between onan and any bird because of the panda loan, right? So for this system, there are a lot of more CO2 emission because of the airplane flow so uh, long distance. So that's an example of this uh, spillover impact is very important to notice. That's why I said earlier, spillover system is very important that we need to pay more attention to it from the telecoupling perspective. So another type of telecoupling is um, <clears throat> uh, agricultural products and uh, agricultural trade. And uh, that's uh, uh, very important because the farmers uh, in Onan produce product and sell to the people in the cities. And then this diagram show total income from cabbage and livestock produced in Onan. So over time, it increased. And here, I draw your attention. This is 2003 when SARS occurred. But actually, SARS did not have impact on the income from cabbage and livestock uh, uh, sale from Onan to the cities. So, so the impact uh, are different. You know, for tourism, the impact was quite big. And for uh, the income from cabbage and livestock, and no impact. So on the other hand, farmers also buy industrial products like uh, fertilizers from uh, outside, the, from the cities. And uh, so they also increase over time. Again, the SARS did not have impact on the uh, total amount of uh, fertilizer purchased by own farmers. Another type of uh, telecoupling is information uh, <clears throat> uh, dissemination. And uh, information about Onun is disseminated through out uh, uh, to other parts of the world and by news media like New York Times, BBC, CNN, and so on and so forth. So that's something that uh, very important because the information flow is driving a lot of other types of uh, telecoupling. And here is a diagram showing the uh, international news articles containing the words on nature regime published in English. Here you can see the, uh, we had the data from 1980, it's quite stable. And they, uh, this one in 2001, it had a peak because we published a paper in Science Magazine, talk about the panda habitat degradation in the panda reserve. And then 2003, the uh, SARS actually generated more news reports, but the highest number of news reports was in 2008 when the earthquake occurred. So that demonstrated this dynamics over time again. So another type of uh, telecoupling is conservation subsidies. And um, this uh, uh, ONUN received a lot of uh, financial support from the government, central government in Beijing and also international organizations. One of the um, financial subsidies is natural forest conservation program, which uh, provides support to the farmers to protect the natural forest so that the, no one can illegally harvest the natural forest. So farmers get some money from monitoring the forest. Um, so you can see here, this accumulated amount over time. This is a total amount to all the farmers in the Panda Reserve, right? By means of yuan. So uh, another program also provides subsidies to for farmers is a green, uh, to green, uh, green to green program, which is to encourage farmers to convert 
the farmland to uh, forest and to for panda conservation. So they also increase over time, but the uh, SARS in 2003 did not have impact on this. So the subsidies program continue despite the SARS in, um, uh, uh, outbreak. So here is a map show that, that the uh, changes in the reconstruction after the earthquake that I mentioned earlier, the household move the houses to a central areas here. But in the past, all the houses were scattered near the, uh, 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 on the mountain slopes. So that's very dangerous because when you have uh, earthquake, then you cause landslide, then the landslide will destroy the houses. So that makes the houses more vulnerable by move the um, houses down to a flat area, then you enhance the resilience to the earthquake. So that's another example of how we could enhance the resilience through um, those kind of actions. And then panda habitat also uh, begin to recover you know, earlier I mentioned that we, we had a paper in 2001 in science, we report the panda habitat actually decreased uh, over time, even after the reserve was established in 1975. And then in 2001, and uh, because of the new uh, conservation subsidies that I just mentioned and the other pillar covering uh, impact, then the panda habitat began to improve. And although it dropped uh, somewhat in 2008 due to the earthquake impact. But and again, after that, and the habitat continued to recover. So by 2016, the uh, IUCN, the International Union of Conservation of Nature, removed pandas from the endangered species list. So Pandas are no longer in danger right? due to the conservation effort, due to the uh, pillar carbon processes um, that the interaction between owner and the outside. And uh, although there's still some other uh, threat, including climate change. So my collaborators and I are working on how climate change could have impact on the future of panda habitat and the panda um, biology and the panda population. So we want to continue to make sure that panda continue to recover and sustainable here. So now I'm going to uh, talk about some of the implication of what we learned from the past sharks for the post COVID-19 world. And we talk about those the issues and the that gave me some insights for uh, anticipate what would happen in the future after the pandemic is over. So why is resilience in the post COVID-19 world? I think overall pillar coupling between urban and um, rural areas will become stronger and because of several reasons. Why is urban area population size continue to increase so that demand for and the food and other uh, foods and products will continue to increase. And also uh, the uh, change in lifestyle in the urban residents, like the diets will change too. That require even more resources to produce uh, meat instead of just the grain. So that will become stronger. And then, but most of uh, um, pillar covering like uh, information flow also will become stronger. While other uh, uh, processes like illegal wildlife trade for consumption may become weaker because the policies implemented and the lessons that we learned from SARS, from COVID-19, because uh, a lot of people believe that this uh, the COVID originate from the wildlife um, consumption. 
So that I think is a good positive way of enhancing resilience in the future. In terms of speed of recovery, I think they will be different for different uh, pelicarbon processes. I think the trade will recover much faster than tourism. As we see now, tourism basically shut down in many places, but trade, especially food trade, continue. Although there's some uh, reduction, but I think that kind of recovery will pick up after the COVID is over. Another thing that we need to do is to really to balance pellet couplings with the local supply chain, local product. And we cannot just say, uh, use all the resources from distant places. And we cannot just use all the resources, the product produced locally. We need to balance that because uh, a balance will help to reduce the environment impact also to enhance the diversity of supplies and to reduce the spray of pandemics and enhance the resilience. And in terms of say, uh, sustainability in the post COVID-19 world, I think um, sustainability will be mixed depend on the actions now and the, the future. As we see here uh, earlier, that I show you Onan Nature Reserve and uh, uh, the panda habitat actually become more sustainable. They um, despite the sharks from SARS, from earthquake, and uh, also the uh, resident, the library food become more sustainable because they um, uh, have more diverse uh, source of income. So that's good. But global sustainability is uncertain. As we saw earlier, the slide that I showed the global trade example. Global trade increased over time, but as you all know, environmental aspect of uh, around the world in general has been continuing uh, declining more biodiversity loss, despite a lot of conservation efforts and more land conversion. So that's, I think, something that we need to work hard on. And uh, so we need to turn the crisis of this COVID and into opportunity to expand actions and like an investment. Many people have talked about this, invest in sustainable um, uh, environment, uh, friendly uh, areas and to help achieve the UN sustainable development goal. So to achieve the goal, one of the things that I call uh, for more attention to spare over system. If we don't pay attention to spare over system, even we can achieve sustainability in one place, then we may have to sacrifice sustainability in other places too. So then globally, we cannot achieve sustainability. Actually a paper that we published last year demonstrated that. So some places increase the sustainability, um, but it is the cost of sustainability in other places. And so those kind of impact need to be um, really uh, paid attention to. So finally, I want to thank you so much. This is a website. And for those who are more interested in getting uh, more information about Taylor Covering and uh, some of our other work, then you can visit this website. And then I will uh, stop here and uh, we'll appreciate any feedback or questions you have. So thank you so much for your time. Great, thank you very much for that very interesting talk, which is extremely relevant to many things you've been discussing today. Um, we do have two questions, which is great. So I will read out, I'll read them out. The first one is from Damien Maraj, and he says, how are you anticipating the next synchronous bamboo blooming in, in Wolong Reserve? Yeah, so bamboo is the main food for the uh, pandas in the wild. 
and 99% of the food is uh, bamboo. So bamboo has a very interesting life cycle. So depend different type of species, so they may flower every three or to nine to nine decades. And of course, the uh, cycle will be changed, um, uh, influenced by a lot of factors, local factors like soil and also climate. And um, so human activity as well. So depend on the locations. And in the Panda Reserve that I mentioned earlier, actually in the 80s, there was a big uh, uh, bamboo flower. So once the bamboo flower, then they die, then pandas will not have uh, food to eat. So the strategy for us to do is to diversify the bamboo species across the habitat for the pandas. So if one species flowers, then you have other alternative species for the pan, uh, pandas to eat. So I think if you talk about um, some of the species uh, flower uh, every five decades, then maybe we can anticipate a, another flowering soon in the panda reserve. But if you talk about the species for um, uh, six decades or seven, then maybe we have a little bit more time window to uh, see the bamboo flowering in that area. So I think the key is to take proactive actions. This is one of the actions that we propose to the government. We need to consider um, climate change impact in addition to human impact, which is great. The government has done an uh, excellent job in reduce direct human impact through conservation program. But for the long term, the uh, climate change impact still need to be incorporated into conservation effort in the future. So uh, pandas have a wide range of uh, distribution, even though the distribution range has been reduced dramatically. So now the remaining uh, habitat areas are in three provinces now in uh, Sichuan the province, which is um, the uh, area that we have done most uh, intensive long-term studies. But also uh, there are Yangshu and uh, Shanxi province, which have some smaller number of pandas there too. So the bamboo species uh, for pandas, uh, there are uh, several dozen of species that panda can eat, and, but they are different in different locations. For a particular location in a small area, they only have one or two or three. In all known, there are three major types of uh, bamboo species. So I think that something, that's something that we are working to enhance the diversity of the uh, bamboo species. Thank you. And then the second question is um, from Mark Lawrence, and he says, you suggested illegal wildlife trade may decrease as a result of COVID impacts but don't you think related spillover effects, including poaching, will likely increase as the telecoupling connections of core and periphery via tourism is weakened? And he gives the example of East African safari landscapes. Yes, I think that's different regions will be different. And some region may be see actually increase in wild, illegal wildlife uh, poaching and uh, uh, trade. So that's something that we really needed to take a global effort and uh, it's not just the one region issue. So that's why this pillar carbon framework is so powerful. We can connect all this together. It's not talk about the center, it's not talk about the uh, peripheries. And um, so we need to consider the whole world as one entire system. Then we can track the agents and the who are responsible for this and the causes, why? And the, one of the solutions that I would suggest is really to help the local people address the livelihood issue. So uh, I think a lot of people uh, hunt wildlife uh, illegally because they don't have other alternative livelihood. And I think um, it's important when we talk about conservation, we have to consider human dimension. That's why we introduced this uh, couple the human natural system framework. We really need to 
help people and uh, not just the you know folks on the wildlife preserve, but uh, by helping people, then we can actually more effectively address conservation issues. And uh, that's what we did in Onun. We talked with uh, you know local resident and understand their concerns. In Onun, actually, the government they trying to move people out. And, but a lot of times people did not want to move out. Even the government provide um, uh, economic incentives for them. And some people did move out, then they move back again because they could not get used to the outside environment. So one suggestion we made was to, instead of move those old people out or by household, then we said, well, we enhance the education for children. Then if children can go to school and get a high education in college, and um, then they will not go back to Ordnung Nature Reserve. Then you will reduce the human population size in Ordnung. And then uh, because the old people there, they cannot um, have babies anymore. And <laughs> it's much more ecologically effective because uh, you don't have uh, babies born in Ordnung uh, due to those children uh, going to college and they have a family in the cities. And then uh, the older people could not do much da damage anymore because they cannot climb to the big mountains, high mountains to uh, illegally poach or harvest in forest. And also socially acceptable because um, <clears throat> The old people don't want to move out, but they like the children, grandchildren to move out. They actually feel very proud if the children, grandchildren can go to college and uh, sort of find jobs in cities. And also economically more efficient because move people by household is more expensive than uh, support the school education. And then of course, in the long run, you have higher population quality because more people get a higher education. So there's a lot of benefit. So we need to really consider the human aspect, how to um, achieve one, one, one situation. So thank you. Great, thank you so much. It's extremely interesting with so many interactions and possible spillover effects. Unfortunately, we've come to the end of the time. Um, so we'll have to end the conversation here, but it, thank you very much for the wonderful presentation and I hope that in future we can somehow continue these conversations. Thank you. Thank you all for your attention and your time. Thanks for, again, for all this important uh, event. So thank you. Thank you.